This Week in Startups is brought to you by Envision. Get Envision for startups with unlimited users on the full suite of Envision tools, plus enterprise-level security and support at envision.com slash twist. That's I-N-V-I-S-I-O-N. LinkedIn. To redeem a free $100 LinkedIn ad credit and launch your first campaign, go to linkedin.com slash thisweekinstartups. And Carta. Simplify how you manage equity with Carta. To get 20% off Carta's cap table software and 409A valuations, go to carta.com slash twist. Hey, everybody. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of This Week in Startups. I'm your host, Jason Calacanis. I'm an angel investor, entrepreneur, writer, and podcast host here in the Silicon Valley. I've invested in over 200 companies. And one of the things I do on a regular basis, that is one of the most productive things I do during my week. And one of the things that's the most joyful for me is I sit with founders, some of them in my portfolio, some of them not in my portfolio or not yet in my portfolio. um, And I ask them, what's the toughest thing you're dealing with? What's the hardest, most acute problem? And then I try to just brainstorm with them solutions. And I'll typically do this with a number of other founders. So we can kind of do a jam session. We call it office hours. And it's something that my friend Travis at Uber used to do. He would have a bunch of different entrepreneurs get together and just jam on an issue. And so we kind of stole that format. We do it in our portfolio. And it works quite well. Today, we're going to do office hours here at my studio in San Francisco. First up is Anne from The Guild which is letsguild.com. Let's start with what is The Guild? And welcome to the program. Thanks so much, Jason. Thanks for having us. And um, The Guild is a networking platform that makes matches. I know you know Weave, which was a service that was out there a while ago. And basically, we do the same. We connect people. That was a YC company. It was, yeah. Yeah, it failed. Failed. I passed on investing. I got that one right. Yeah, you did. Yeah. Now you know you can get it right. Okay. Do you know why we failed? (laughs) Um, they never automated their algorithms okay. and they ran through the 2 million, I think they had in funding within a very short amount of time. They uh, hired 16 people, I think oh. much too big of a team. So maybe they went too fast. A little bit too fast. And yeah. I don't think they, uh, focused on the core market first. Got it. So they had no beachhead. They spent too much money, didn't have enough runway. That's a recipe for disaster. I always like to ask founders, by the way who their competitors competitors are, you brought it up right away, and and why they failed. Because it shows if a founder actually is studying that or maybe talking uh, to people who worked at the company, figuring out what the pitfalls were. Um, so what is the focus at the Guild, and how is it different than Weave? And then what's your biggest challenge? So we connect people to each other one-on-one for a coffee around the corner at the cool new coffee shop or at the new wine bar down in the Mission. And uh, we do that based on your profile, but not just looking backwards and at your LinkedIn roles and all these things that you've accomplished, but we also ask you, Jason, who do you want to be in the future? Do you mm. still want to be an author, podcast host, podcast host or, or an entrepreneur uh, yeah. investor, or do you maybe want to be a speedboat captain? And if I you want to say, design dresses. <laughs> you like, want to design dresses. Like Amazing. Jack from Twitter. So if we look at your LinkedIn profile right now, would we connect you with a dressmaker or anybody in the fashion industry? Got it. So the concept is I go to letsguild.com. I put in my LinkedIn. And then I'm not looking for a date. I'm looking for a match on a business and a career basis. Correct. So this is a matching service to help me find people who might be a peer, a mentor, a customer, what? Any of the above. Any of the above. Okay. So you have a dashboard and you can really dial that. And maybe this week you're interested in meeting an investor and next week you're interested in sharing stories with a peer. Got it. And how are people using it right now? So they go online, they fill out their profile, and then on a Monday morning, they have an email in their inbox that says, Jason, why don't you meet with Anne on Thursday at 5 p.m. at this place and talk about networking in so That's you prompt them with like I, I think Coffee Meets Bagel does a similar device, right? They give you like yep. here's somebody to have coffee. Correct. With. Yeah. Is that the device one recommendation? One recommendation. And that's done auto magically. Yep. Uh, so and then do you have a human look at it before yeah. it goes out? That's me. Ah, so you <laughs> check to make sure that this is a good one. Yeah. Um, That's my Sunday nights. <laughs> oh really? How, what's the largest number of invites that have gone out on a Monday? 
And what's the percentage typically of people who then go and meet with somebody? So we have about 62% that react to the match. And then we don't know exactly how many matches actually happen Got it. because you can take it off and mm. and answer by email. How do you define react? Open, click, what? Confirm the meeting, reschedule the meeting, or cancel the meeting. Okay, so they have to actually take that definitive action. Correct. And when you do that, do you just CC them with each other and they have each other's email automatically? or It's on the platform Got or it. you can do it through email, but that mm. we can't track. So we can track right. what's on the platform, but we can't track if you just send me an email, say. That's interesting. Yeah. So the email takes away friction. Yeah. Um, but we the lose plat- insights. you lose insights, right? So unless you made, yeah, there would be no way to know. Mm-hmm. Unless people, after they met each other, then got to rate the meeting. We do. We do oh, ask you do that? But that percentage is quite low. So only 10% of mm-hmm. the people that we think had a meeting actually rate the meeting. Yeah, that's that may be low, but it might be enough data for oh, you for to sure. figure out if it's valuable. And that's the feedback mechanisms that feed mm. the AI that's in the system. Got it. So what I, I I like the idea for the business. I've always liked this idea. I liked Weave candidly. Mm-hmm. I thought that was a very cool idea um, to do Tinder for business. So I'm looking for a designer. I'm looking for an investor. I swipe left or right, um, and maybe get to find some. Especially if you're maybe network light. You're starting your career. You want to meet people. When you're older, you don't want to meet people because <laughs> you have too many connections and you can't keep up with them. Right. So does your does your service skew? people earlier in their career or people transitioning careers or does it hit people who are salespeople? Who's the beachhead here? The beachhead are actually the entrepreneurs. And so Ah. that's why we have some of them here today. Great. And the the entrepreneurs come to the platform to meet with other entrepreneurs Mm -hmm. and also to meet with investors. And we do specific programs where we say Mm. for four weeks, you can meet with investors. We connect you Mm. for 30 minute video chats, for instance, from all over the world even. So what's your biggest challenge? So the biggest challenge is actually not in the B2C space, it's in the B2B space. Because last year we figured the big numbers and the growth is probably in the B2B by white labeling this technology and allowing other communities to use a matchmaking technology in their communities. So for instance, we have a co-working space that uses the Guild technology. So within the profile that you fill out anyways to be part of this co-working space and book rooms, you can now also create a networking profile and meet mentors and so forth in that co-working community. Hmm. And so it's just one sale, right? And then we charge a licensing fee of, in this case, $3 per user per month. Got it. But the challenge is I'm speaking to all these communities and they love it because it's activation of their members and their communities. But then I come to the pricing part of it and I think I don't have that right yet. Mm. And maybe I'll come too much from the B2C side where I say right now it costs $5 or $10 per user per month. And that's the two plans you can choose from. And so obviously it has to be cheaper for B2B but on the other hand, you know, my sales cycles are much longer and also it's customization involved in these kinds of models mostly. Yeah. And so how do I price this and not also shoot myself in the foot by now uh, sending my members to a B2B community yeah. that offers it for cheaper? Is the B2C product where you're just one website with a whole bunch of people, is that working? Are people paying for it? Is it yeah. just... Yeah, and is it growing 20% month over month, 30%? No. Ah. So what that would indicate in the B2C space is that maybe it's not providing enough value. Mm-hmm. It might be providing some value, but not enough that people are willing to pay for it. So now you found another group of another way to get paid, which is make it free for the users who mm-hmm. don't get a ton of value from it that they'd be willing to come out of pocket themselves, but maybe uh, a community like we work or some space galvanize would pay because they want their members to do it the problem is they too it might not be number one on their list correct and i have found some communities where mm. this is number one on their list mm. and they for instance want to connect their ceos and their network with each other mm. or they are already very curated networks but then it always comes down to you know the unit economics and how do i price it because they're they're happy to pay even 20 30k to implement it customize it but then how do i think about licensing fees hey everybody i want to talk to you a little bit about envision this is an amazing tool 
for product designers to help work between the idea people in your organization, like the founders and the designers, the UX people, and of course, the developers. And so they have an amazing new streamlined workflow tool, and it helps you from design to development and makes your startup life more manageable. You have had these late nights, these 11th hour meetings, rolling deadlines, and Vision gets it. And Envision for Startups gives you unlimited accounts. That means everybody in your organization is going to be able to use it on the full suite of Envision tools, all packaged with startups in mind. This includes unlimited accounts for collaboration, enterprise-level security, and custom support. Envision is used by thousands of startups, including Zapier, Lime, Treehouse, Scribd, and Envision is used by 100% of the Fortune 100. Making great products is critical if you want to compete in the startup ecosystem, and Envision is going to help you do that. You can quickly turn your ideas into a powerful screen design. This is before you have to write any code. You can make the entire app work on your screen with vector-based drawing in multiple layers, digital whiteboarding and freehand sketching and wireframing, prototyping and animations, and the delivery is super simple. You just hand it off from design to development and you're off to the races. So here is your call to action, everybody. Get InVision for startups at InVision.com slash twist. That's I-N-V-I-S-I-O-N. InVision.com slash twist. That's InVision.com slash twist. Streamline your workflow with unlimited users on the full suite of InVision tools, plus enterprise level security and support. It's a great product. We use it. We love it. Go ahead and check it out. InVision.com. That's I-N-V-I-S-I-O-N.com slash twist and get those unlimited users on board right now. Okay, let's get back to this amazing episode. Yeah, it's a conundrum, I think, because if you look at the other matchmaking services, they typically are able to charge a large dollar amount because it's either with Tinder, people are looking to hook up and they're willing to pay for that. And then with eHarmony, they're looking to find a spouse and actually they're on a marriage track. Mm -hmm. They specifically want to start a family. I think that's how they pitch it. Um for people who want to start families. And I think they charge 50 bucks a month or 40 bucks a month. So in those two situations, the benchmark and the value of a connection is very high mm -hmm. um, because it has to do with romance or a significant other and building a life together. And then I guess in business, like the question would be, is the connection so high that it's worth paying for? Mm hmm and maybe what you found is the connections are generally not that high, but it seems like you may have found one or two instances where they are high, which is meeting an investor. Recruiting as Recruiting, well. Recruiting, yeah. And then large VC firms are interested mm. too because all their value is in their network. And if mm. they can just get that one deal through the platform right. that they would otherwise mm. pass on, it's worth anything, yeah. right? So most people would say the best way to price this is to start with a price that makes it very easy mm -hmm. for the early folks to say yes. So the per seating pricing, in one way, you would think lowers the risk because, well, if you're charging $3 or $5 per month, it doesn't seem like a lot, like Slack. Um, but it's kind of uncapped in terms of the number of people. And mm -hmm. you might just want to say, I'm going to get the first five clients on the platform and make it super valuable and just charge them $250 a month or $500 a month. Flat fee. Just a flat fee, mm -hmm. so there's no risk. And then really work on uh, trying to provide massive value and make it indispensable. Mm -hmm. And that was my concern with Weave, and that's my concern with your business, which is, is this actually something that people can't live without? Is it so good? Are the connections so great that people can't live without it? And I think with when you look at Tinder or eHarmony, you know, they have challenges. If people do wind up getting married, they lose their customer. Uh, but then other platforms, let's say AngelList Jobs, uh, LinkedIn Jobs, ZipRecruiter, because people are constantly hiring and there's something massively at stake, they, you know, and there's so much cost involved in that, if there is a mistake, that they're able to charge a massive premium, whether it's a $300 listing or a $3,000 a month account or a $5,000 a month account or $5,000 a year for having a recruiter on the system. So I think that's what you're going to really have to contend with. Mm -hmm. But if you're in this experimental phase, and I think it's an, you're still in that experimental oh, phase, sure. yeah. uh -huh. why not just get five communities who are really serious about it and will give you the email addresses of everybody mm -hmm. uh, and 
five hundred bucks a month. A one year test is only six thousand dollars. One tenant is worth six thousand dollars there, right? right? At one of these co working spaces, probably the average is five hundred to a thousand dollars a month. For sure, yeah. So if you can get people to stay and get more value out of the co working space. And people feel like if you go to that co-working space, you might meet your next investor or employee. Boy, that could be, or partner or sales, mm -hmm. that could be a real value add. So mm -hmm. I, that's what I would do is I'd make awesome. it low enough price. Then you can always raise the prices later and say, we're going to grandfather you in. So you right. send them an email and say, dear Galvanize, you're currently on the $500 a month plan. You had 75 people use it this month starting May 1st. Or starting June 1st, uh, or starting today, the prices are going to go up. But don't worry. Your price has been grandfathered in till the end of 2019. Starting in 2020, your account will go to you know, uh, $10 per person per month. That would have been a $750 bill. Your current bill is $500. Wanted to make you aware of that. If you have any questions, hit reply. I'm the CEO. Yeah. And yeah. I'll talk to you. So The Netflix model. <laughs> yeah. They just tell you the prices are going up. Right. And I mean, if you look at Amazon Prime, I think my first Prime account was either $39 or $49. Oh, wow. yeah. <laughs> and I think Amazon Prime now is $150. Oh, I thought it was 100, but maybe I'm behind. I think it's over 100 <laughs> now. And they're bo it's called boiling the frog in the business. It's kind uh -huh, of gross, but uh -huh. <laughs> that's what people do is they boil the frog. So first you want to have that product market fit. So cart is a little bit before the horse right now. Get people addicted to it. Make it so people cannot live without it. And I think Coffee Meets Bagel is a really interesting. I passed on investing in that startup as well, but I understand they're doing very well now. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I know one of the founders. You know one of the founders, yeah. 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 Um, and they seem to have figured something out, which is like less is more, sending one or two people a week and making it high quality is the move. So you, you might have uh, cribbed something really interesting as a device and getting that Monday meeting out. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, so keep pulling the string awesome. and keep testing. Cool. All right. Awesome. Well done. Thank you. Okay. Welcome back to Office Hours. I'm Jason Calacanis, an angel investor here in the Silicon Valley. If you've got a great company that's got 10, 20, 30K a month in traction, it's kind of my sweet spot where we like to engage with startups, maybe have them come to our accelerator and then syndicate them. My email is jason at calacanis.com, my first name at my last name. I actually get those emails uh, and I respond to a good number of them. If you make them long and there's no charts and data and links, Mm, unlikely I'm going to reply, but if it's got a link to a product, I'm likely to click. And if it's got a chart, oh my. I uh, love charts. I love an up and to the right chart. Okay, my next guest is Hoda here on Office Hours, and she's with a company called Stock Card, stockcard.io. I know you pitched me at some point. Refresh my memory, Hoda. What does Stock Card do, and what is your biggest challenge? Sure. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Uh, Stock Card is an online tool for do it yourself investors, and we help them make their investment research mistake free. Okay, so I am a public markets investor. Our beachhead is public market Great. Uh, investors. So I'm a stay-at-home day trader type or an executive who likes to actively trade stocks on Robinhood or something? Yeah, we're actually uh, targeted more on people who are very busy. So you mm -hmm. don't need to be a stay-at-home trader because ah. those kind of people have their own models and they are, they've established their own processes. We are going after busy engineer, you know, product manager or, you know, doctor, lawyer. And how does it work? Busy. What is the device? I say I want to invest in Netflix or the new Lyft or Uber IPOs. Mm -hmm. page your duty and then you do what yeah so it, the process starts even earlier than that meaning that you come into our platform uh similar to netflix you could define what are the stuff that you're related you're interested in like the, these are the values i have these are the things i'm interested in. and then we narrow down the global universe of all the stocks available to a manageable list for you huh. so that you could play with that and then after that you could actually do your research on our platform which is what you alluded to let's say Netflix. Mm. Uh, so what we do is we automatically collect hundreds of different pieces of information and visualize it in a way for a non-financial person understandable. It's very intuitive. We, mm. we bring a lot of intuitive format from other walks of life into our, our platform. So between Yahoo Finance mm -hmm. and a Bloomberg terminal, where would you sit? We're actually, we, we're best of both mm -hmm. because Yahoo Finance gives you a lot of information but doesn't guide you mm -hmm. to what you need to know yeah. versus Bloomberg goes very deep in terms of whatever you, tons of things that you, a normal person most, most likely won't look at it if they don't know. So we bring that together and we present it in a way that a person who doesn't have finance background can understand it. What are the top two things people need to know that you provide them with when making 
a decision about buying a stock in order. Yeah. So there's four four top things we actually provide, okay. which market they operate in and how it's growing, how the how, what is the strength of the operations of the company, what has been the historical return of investing in this company, and whether the share of the stock, the stock price is uh, undervalued or overvalued. Got it. Those are the, f- actually, we came to those questions because uh, the type of people that we target, they are asking those questions all the time from themselves. Hmm. So we, we do it in a very easy way so that they don't need to spend that much so time. So they want to know what sector they're in. They want to know how they've performed mm-hmm. historically. Mm-hmm. And they want to know if this is a good idea to invest in the company. Exactly. Okay, that makes sense. When you advertise on LinkedIn, you are going to get access to the most professional, highest end customers, the most amazing leads for your business that are available anywhere on the internet. These will translate into website traffic and higher brand awareness and conversions. The first step is to get the right audience. And every day, 500 million professionals engage with content on LinkedIn. What an amazing concept that is. A half billion people are engaging with content on LinkedIn and your future customers are obviously among those people. LinkedIn has developed marketing tools to help you target customers with precision. And here's how it works. We did it for Sydney. And we're looking for startups and executives from big tech to attend the launch festival in Sydney. And as you can see here, we picked New Zealand, we picked Australia, we picked investors, we picked marketing specialists, salespeople, sales assistants, entrepreneurs, people who are interested in startups and the community for startups. You can do all this incredible tracking. And then we uploaded our ad and said, hey, join us for Launch Festival Sydney 2019. Get your tickets here, launchfestival.com slash purchase, put up an image and bing, bang, boom, we are up and running and targeting the most important targets for us for the Launch Festival. Well, just think about your own business. You can target people by their geography, you can target them by their title, by their skills, by what groups they're interested in. So here is your call to action. Get a hundred dollars, a C note, a hundy, Get a hundy right now at linkedin.com slash This Week in Startups. That's right. Go to linkedin.com slash This Week in Startups and get the $100 ad credit. That's $100 at linkedin.com slash This Week in Startups. Okay, let's get back to this amazing episode. How do you make money? It's a subscription-based uh, tool. Uh, so it. there's a forever free and then you can upgrade to premium Great. features. What's your biggest challenge? The biggest challenge is we're early on, obviously, an early uh, stage product, and um, we have this myopic focus on creating retention. Uh, If you think about this whole analogy of leaky bucket, we don't want to have a leaky Mm -hmm. bucket. So since day one, when we went uh, live, our focus was let's increase our month one retention, month two retention, all the way to now we're on month 14 Mm -hmm. retention. Uh, But that means that 80% of our time goes to this focusing on retention and bringing users back in then we would focus on traction. But at the same time, we're getting ready to 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 raise uh, yeah. an angel round. And any consumer product angel uh, investor that we go talk to, they get scared because we don't have that aggressive traction. It hasn't been our focus yet on top of the funnel. Sure. So I'm trying to figure out what, would we continue to do what's best for our users and our product or try to just kind of create a lot of buzz and bring users and they may not necessarily stay? Sure. How do we balance that so that we appeal to angel investors? Okay, so you want to raise money. Mm-hmm. Angel investors uh, are who you're targeting. Individuals who are investing their own money. Correct. Perhaps you would also consider a seed fund where somebody writes smaller checks, 500K checks. Absolutely. And you're looking to raise 250000 to $1.5 million, I'm going to guess. Something we were there. looking for 900 900 perfect. Uh, so this would be a seed stage round. Mm-hmm. It's a little bit beyond friends and family, unless yeah. your family happens and your friends happen to be really rich. Uh, this would mean you're going to have to go meet people uh, who you don't know uh, through your network and convince them that this business can return 50 to 100 times their money. So if you're raising 900, I'm assuming you want to give up, let's say, 20% of the business for that amount, a 4.55 million dollar valuation. To be in the norm. <laughs> okay, great. Yeah. Here in Silicon Valley, that'd be the norm. And if you were on the East Coast or Miami or Boston, it would be maybe even a third less than that. Yeah. So the 900, you, you might raise. For twenty, you might raise five hundred for twenty percent. Mm-hmm. So uh, you get a little premium here for being in Silicon Valley. So they're going to look at it, and somebody who's got experience is not going to care about the total 
number of users as much as the massive amount of value even a small number of users are getting. Mm -hmm. So what would that look like? It would be the number of times they use these cards to make mm -hmm. a decision, mm -hmm. uh, maybe how many times they open the app. So mm -hmm. the daily active users mm -hmm. as compared to the monthly active users. Mm -hmm. Two examples, Slack had an extremely high daily active user rate to the monthly active user rate. In fact, I think it was 50%. Yeah. And then the product that came before it, Yammer, was less. It was like 10% mm -hmm. of the daily active user, 10% of monthly active users used it every day. Um, and one of the things that Twitter, a public company now, has done right is the 300, they have about 300 million monthly users. Mm -hmm. It's not growing. It hasn't grown for like yeah. two or three years, yeah. maybe three or four years. But the daily active users have gone up in that same period of time, three or four years, by like a third. Yeah. So they're actually getting more of the people on the platform to use it every day, mm. which is super fascinating. Snapchat's the other example. Snapchat in the early days, there weren't a ton of people using it, but they were using it something to the effect of 10 to 20 times a day. And then there were people using it 30, 40, 50 times a day right. because it was messaging plus video. It was kind of a very unique mm -hmm. product in that way. So there are some investors who would look at that what do you charge per subscription per month? Um, Eleven ninety nine for middle middle tier, yep. and then uh, thirty four ninety nine for top tier. Got it. Uh, and you have hundreds or thousands of people doing this, or dozens? We have we have uh, the broader community is about seven thousand people unpaid, uh, unpaid, right? And then two percent of that converted so far to paid user. So you have a hundred and fifty or so people mm -hmm. paying. Mm -hmm. So that's the data people are going to look at: is do you actually have the ability to get people in the top of the funnel and then convert them, and then how many of them stick with it? So it's going to be, I, I believe that. These data information services are probably looked at as medium-sized businesses, mm -hmm. not quite lifestyle businesses, but medium-sized businesses by the investment community. Yeah. Has that been your experience? They, they refer to it as a lifestyle business? That said, and they also said, I don't see the path to be a billion-dollar company. Okay. Um, but I do, but you know, it's Great. just- Great. So this is where you um, can really start to up your game. Mm. Now we know that they don't believe that's a billion dollar company mm -hmm. in market cap. You do. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's your job as the founder to convince them through data mm -hmm. uh, and through product and vision and customers, all these things, but data would be the way to mm -hmm. figure that out. We like to have people explain to us how they get to 100 million in revenue, yeah. or 50 million. Mm -hmm. Either of those numbers you can pick. And right now, if you've got 100 people paying $10 a month, I'm just going to average it out to make yeah, it simple fine. math. That's $1,000 a month, 12000 a year. If you were to 100x that, uh, you'd be at 100000 a month, $1 million a year. Mm -hmm. It's pretty easy to believe you could 100x this. I mean, mm -hmm. if you found 100 people willing to pay for it, you could find um, you know, 10,000, mm -hmm. but it's going to be a journey. It's going to take some time. And mm -hmm. then to go from one to 10 is going to be very hard. Right. And to go from 10 million to 50 million is going to be extraordinarily hard. Mm -hmm. And so that's what you're up against. We've had a number of companies like com.com where they came to us with 10 K a month in revenue. Mm -hmm. And we were able to envision a world where instead of having a thousand people buying the product for $10 a month, maybe they'd have a million people paying, mm -hmm. you know, 10 bucks a month. And I think they pay six or seven a month on average now because they sell by the mm -hmm. year. So it's going to be hard for you to convince people um, that this can get to 100 million in revenue, which is call it 8 million a month, 8 million a month divided by 30 mm -hmm. days, you mm -hmm. start to get to, these are big, big numbers. numbers you got to get to. Um, so that's going to be your job. Is there another analogous company mm -hmm. where people do pay for it? I think Robinhood would be that company. Yeah. How many members does Robinhood have? You know? About 6 million at this point. 6 million unpaid users. Correct. Of those, how many do you think they've converted haven't to- Haven't done very well. <laughs> they've done very well they haven't done very well to their premium model that's oh. why they're trying to become a bank as far as i understand yeah but they do have a big community to be able to convert yeah. to banking customer let's say they converted you converted two percent let's say mm -hmm. with all their funding they converted five percent mm -hmm. that would five percent of a million is fifty thousand five percent of sixty million is three hundred thousand mm -hmm. three hundred thousand what do they charge uh about a little bit ten. of slightly more than ten yeah ten a month yeah ten a month so if they had 300,000 people at $10 a month, mm -hmm. it's $36 million a year. Yeah. So even though they might not have done very well, mm -hmm. 
they may be sitting on a money printing machine and maybe that's why they're worth five billion. Oh, yes, that's true. But I, I think I, I, I I'm love an investor, that. full disclosure. But I don't know any of the data because they don't send me updates. Obviously. But uh, <laughs> if you think about it, if a company was to be worth $5 billion, if we just, I'm, we're just backing into the numbers here. Yeah, and so yeah, this yeah. is a great thing to do as mm -hmm. an exercise. Why would investors value it at five, $5 billion? Well, if they saw those 36, uh, if they saw 300,000 people yeah. spending $120 a year. Yeah. At roughly three thirty million a year. Yeah. If they ten x that, that's three hundred million a year, and twenty times three hundred million right, is right, right. Uh, all of a sudden you're at six billion. Well, so can I actually ask a question on top of that? Sure. Because what I've heard, but obviously you know better because you you know them better. Uh, mm. But from outside, but what we are understanding and they're changing, they're going after becoming a bank for millennials. Yeah. So they are actually saying we have the space that we're trying to monetize to other services that is not the original, you know, that's not the core of the- uh, The trading. The trading. They got to 6 million on trading for free. Exactly. Now they're adding a bank and they have a pro service, yeah. Exactly. So it, that that could also apply to us, but but would that be a good story to say? Because then people say, well, you're saying your existing business, it doesn't work, so you need all these other adjacent businesses that um, comes in. The way I would look at it is, if you think about Amazon Prime, mm -hmm. they keep adding features to it. Mm -hmm. And this is- What's really amazing about s consumer subscriptions, um, every year, if you keep growing, you have more of a budget to spend. Yeah. So if you look at somebody like HBO or Netflix, they've made so much money that they can say, you know what? We're going to do House of Cards. We're going to do mm. Game of Thrones. We're going to outspend network TV. Mm. And that was an amazing moment for them. Then you look at Amazon Prime. They said, we'll make Amazon Prime video for free. We'll make same day for free. We'll add an Apple, uh, Amazon Music mm. to this collection. So that's, I don't think, a sign of weakness. No. It's a sign of having a money printing machine and adding things to it so that the users churn less and get more value for the same price. Yeah. So that's likely what Robin, who's doing, again, I, I don't talk to them all that much, uh, but I think the reason they're doing so well is because they're adding those things. That's not weakness. And so that's one of the things as... A competitor um, or somebody who's in an adjacency, you kind of want to celebrate the success of those companies when you're talking to other investors like Com, like Robinhood, mm. like this other subscription business. We think there's a place for data and analysis and information about what you know decisions to make. And maybe you should be going after Robinhood users. Maybe Robinhood users would love your monthly subscription to, to add to it. There are actually are, as you, yeah. since you smartly alluded yeah. to it, most of our users actually are Robinhood's user. We are yeah. complimentary to Robinhood, so back yeah. to your point. And yeah, you could have a roadmap that shows adding those things. Mm. What people are gonna wanna see is can you get there and how good are you at acquiring customers mm. and then maybe getting them to expand. So the right investors would look at what did you do to get the first 7,000 people? Mm. Did you use Facebook? Did you use Instagram? Did you use press? Did it word of mouth? Then they would look at how good are you at that 2% conversion? Mm. And how did you do it? Did you do it by email? Did you do phone calls, et cetera? Mm. Then how good were you at the $11 to the $39 upsell? Mm. Gotcha. And they're going to look at each part of that funnel and they're going to see if they believe you as the founder Indeed. are a great leader who can master the funnels. Mm. And so that's where I would focus my energy is mastering those funnels. Can yeah. you get from two to 4% conversion on the 7,000? Great. Can you take the $11 subscription and make it you know, $24 and the $39 and make it $69 a month and see if anybody leaves, right? Gotcha. Um, so that's what I would focus on. Got it. And if you're not clearing market with angels, remember, they all lie. <laughs> so when they tell you like it's not big enough, maybe they think it could be big enough. Maybe they think that you're not as good as you need to be yet at executing, gotcha. right? So they're very reticent to criticize an entrepreneur. Mm. So then it is up to the entrepreneur to criticize themselves mm. and to look deeply in the mirror and say, I wonder if I converted 4% and I got people to pay 1995 if they would be different, mm. right? Mm. And so I'm always constant, you know, trading on that myself is mm. I wonder if when they told me it's not a fit for them because they don't do content or it's not a fit for them because it's not big enough. I wonder if it's me. I wonder if it's my own performance. So think about that too. Mm. I don't know if it is or it isn't. That's uh, a good point. But if you can make yourself better at each of those stages right now, I think you're doing the right thing. Good. I think focusing 
on delighting that early group of customers and getting them to not churn, getting them to spend more, and getting more of them to convert at each stage of the funnel um, will eventually lead to some investor believing mm. that this can grow to a $50 million a year run rate business. Nice. Good luck. Thank you. Okay. Uh, we'll be back with more. Almost all the wealth created here in Silicon Valley and technology comes from equity, not salary. People's salaries maybe pay for their rent, but people's boats and planes and houses and vacations, that comes from equity. And we are specialists in this ourselves here at This Week in Startups and as an investor. And all of that gets tracked on something called a cap table, C-A-P, capitalization table. But they're always broken and they're always wrong. We're always having to go back and check them as angel investors uh, and make sure that the employees and everybody's getting the same uh, amount of equity that they were promised because, hey, this is compensation. It really matters. You have to get it right. But companies and attorneys are still using spreadsheets and paper certificates to issue their options and to keep track of equity. This leads to problems if these things are messed up. And they're updated so frequently with every single new hire or if you get a valuation or a new round of funding, and it leads to tons of inaccuracy. Well, Carta fixes cap tables and equity management in more than 10 thousand companies, you heard that right, and VC firms like Slack, Coinbase, Flexport, August Capital, and myself, Jason Calacanis. We have hundreds of billions of dollars in equity captured and managed perfectly by CARTA, C-A-R-T-A. -A. And you can simplify your cap table and make sure it's perfect and not have any drama. Nobody wants cap table drama. Trust me, it is not pleasant as a founder to have to deal with that. You will get 20% off your cap table software and 409A valuations if you go to carta.com slash twist. C-A-R-T-A dot com slash twist. It's super affordable. It's easy to use. You're going to get 20% off at that link. C-A-R-T-A dot com slash twist. You have to get your cap table correct. Go to carta.com slash twist. C-A-R-T-A dot com slash twist. Okay, let's get back to this amazing episode. Welcome back to Office Hours. I'm Jason Calacanis, and I'm sitting with Becky Flint of DragonBoat.io. What is DragonBoat? So DragonBoat is a smart product roadmap platform that helps company to make product decisions and ship results faster. Okay. Uh, make it easier, people call it, it's Becky in a box. It's Becky in a box? Yes. What does this mean? I don't understand this analogy. So, uh, you know, I'm Becky. I've been working in a product development industry for a long time. Okay. Uh, so I actually shipped almost 10 million hours of products throughout right. my career. And to learn a couple of tricks and try to build in the product so it's intelligent, so that help companies to build product faster and easier. Okay. So this would be for a software company building a product? Mostly software, but can expand it to other technology products as well. So if I was Robin Hood and I wanted to launch, as we discussed, banking mm -hmm. or checking and savings accounts, how would I use uh, Dragon Boat? Yeah, that's a great example. The idea is that when you get to certain size, you will have a lot of competing decisions. How much do I spend on existing product? How much spend on the new product? Where do I focus? How much I focus on my platform? How much focus on specific development? Where do I need resources? Where is the bottlenecks? And how these things coming together? There actually, there's no good tools for you to do that. How do people currently do it? Uh, in most cases, you have four, five, six spreadsheets, like Got I it. have done. Got it. So you make a spreadsheet of your number of developers, and you say how many points they might have mm -hmm. for each of these items, or do a Kanban board or something, and you mm -hmm. count up the number of points. Points equal whatever, typically an hour or right. two. You say you get six, hour, six points per developer per day or eight points per developer per day, and then you try to divvy up the points. Yes. It's how people do this. What is your big challenge with, it's a, so your platform, Dragon Boat, helps people do this. What is your biggest challenge? So our biggest challenge is how do I scale people onboarding and, mm -hmm. and then grow? So, um, so we have built a product in, um, in the last 12 months. Mm -hmm. So product's been working really well. It's a, it's a little bit complex product. Ah. So for people to get used to do it versus the spreadsheets that they, they use today will take some time for them to get ramp up right. and figure out. So we get a lot of signups uh, mm -hmm. organically, uh, but every one of them I have to walk them through. And if I walk them through, it will help them to, to, to use it. And then sometimes need to make a little bit changes of how they do things internally to be more efficient. Mm. Uh, so those are taking a lot of time. So I try Great. to figure out is what is the best way to scale. I have the solution because I have two of my companies who struggle with this. 
both of them have figured it out, and they've both crushed it. The first is a company called Superhuman. That's a Gmail competitor. You've yes. probably heard of it. Um, they insist, if you want to use it, that you have to do an onboarding call, and I think it's 30 minutes. Okay. The reason they do this is because if the person uh, use, does the onboarding, they will be able to become more efficient, i.e. superhuman, mm -hmm. and they will churn less. Because once you start getting value from a product, the chances of you quitting that product go down. Yeah. But just like if somebody goes to the gym and they don't know how to use the weight machines, they feel like an idiot. And nobody showed them how to do it. They don't have any confidence. They quit, right? Mm -hmm. So in a gym, that's why they like to do that orientation, show you how to use machines, maybe get you going. So uh, the other one, which is more applicable, is a company called Marlowe, which does executive coaching. Okay. And they try to sell an executive coaching solution into companies. One of the problems is... Uh, a lot of companies have never had executive coaching. They don't know the value of it. And so what they do is seminars in person at the companies that they charge for a decent amount of money. Right. So you can take a course on here is how you can properly um, do executive coaching mm -hmm. and then they onboard it. So I think you should charge for a resource allocation and roadmap execution and give it a name. Mm -hmm. So here is mastering roadmaps yeah. to save money and build better products. Yeah. A seminar by Becky Flint. Yeah. $795 per person for five people minimum. So it's $4,000 for you to come for a half day to teach people. Yeah. Or it's $2,000 a month if they pay for a year of your product in advance. Mm -hmm. So you charge them for the training. Okay. And then... You now have a revenue model because, like you said, they, they probably are doing it wrong anyway. Right. So instead of thinking about this as I'm charging them for software and throwing in free training, make a training system so good right. that they will pay for it whether they use Dragon Boat or not. Right. And then have a salesperson sell you as the expert in there based upon three or four referrals who say, Becky changed our lives. Right. We now ship products better. That's what the marketing has to say. Right. Becky taught us how to ship faster and better, and everyone in the company is happier and more efficient, and we get home in time to put our kids to bed. But make that a minimum of $4,000 for a two-hour seminar, $10,000, whatever it is. Yeah. Very expensive. Yeah. So that when they get through it, they're like, oh, well, Dragon Boat's so cheap, and we did the seminar. Because right. they're used to paying for corporate education, and these employees are, what's their average salary? $150,000, $100,000? Yeah. More than that. Yeah, well, if they're developers in Silicon yeah. Valley, it could be even more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is nothing. If, right. if you make one of them 5% more efficient, that's saving the company you know, 10000 a year, and you only charge 4000 Yeah. So I would come yeah. up with that course, make a binder, make supporting materials for yeah. it, which you're kind of doing anyway, Yeah. and then sell that product. Okay. And then you can upsell the software. Right, right. Or when people get the software, you can say, yeah, you can just onboard and watch my videos yeah. or I can come there. Which what, would you rather do? Yeah. So what do you think of actually one of the go-to-market plan we have is to have partners, mm -hmm. like a consulting firms. No. And the, no. They will screw it up. Okay. Yeah. The problem with those consulting firms and those VARs is they're going to screw it up. Okay. And it's also going to distance you from the customers and okay. learning. When you go in there and you learn about these customers, it's going to inform you as to what the next products on the roadmap for your software are. Right, right. And so I really hate taking your product and putting it into a bunch of VARs, value-added mm -hmm. resellers, who then you have to train and then you have to hear they did a bad job and people okay. complain. You're the expert. Right. Do this 20 times in the next okay. six months. Right. Make a playbook and then see what happens. So I teach a course called Angel.University. Right. Because I had so many syndicate members and high net worth individuals who want to invest in companies, but they don't know how. So I wrote the book. Yes. And then I teach the course. I've taught yes. the course nine times. And usually it's 50 people in the room. So about 500 people have gone through the course. Yeah. Now those people are more comfortable investing alongside of me and my syndicate. Right. So I said, you know what? We don't make any money off the course. It's $500 per person. Mm -hmm. But because... It does cover our costs and dinner or whatever, but it actually saves us a lot of time because those people then are going to become better investors and they'll identify better companies and send us better companies to invest in. Yeah. So you getting to go in there and spending four hours with the team right? and they paid you, Yeah. now, I mean, you're going to understand what they need. This is like free market research. You might, in another dimension, 
as founder might pay somebody fifty thousand dollars to go do market research like this. Yeah. You can monetize yeah. your market research. Yeah. It's so brilliant. It's definitely uh it makes a lot of sense because one of uh three of our largest customers, they actually paid onboarding and then they mm -hmm. are the more engaged customer as yeah. well. Make it a course, yeah. then make an advanced course, yeah. and then give a certificate. Okay. And people can put it on their LinkedIn, yeah. that they went through the Becky Flint Roadmap Mastery Program. Awesome. All right, awesome. good luck. That's cool. We'll Thank be you. right back. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Office Hours with Jason Calacanis. If you want to be on this podcast, email Jackie at launch.co. Uh, Jackie will pick the best companies, and we're going to do it once a month. Next up is Julie Paul. She is the founder of heardedfromafriend.com. Welcome to the program. And what is Heard It From A Friend? Uh, thank you for having me. Yeah, so, it's my pleasure. Um, Heard It From A Friend is a resource platform devoted to helping women keep up with technology. Got it. And many of us have stepped into the role now of chief technology officer for our families. And sure. screen time has become the number one parenting concern. So through our high-touch service, um, we offer a guided experience with um, backup support in the form of texting and um, concierge services. So if I'm hearing this correctly, it's like Geek Squad. In a way, yeah. In a way. Yes. But instead of fixing your Windows computer with a virus, this is for managing the implementation of the technology, not just the infrastructure of it, but how it should be deployed inside of the family. Exactly. Got it. Yes. And customize around what your family's specific needs are. Got it. How many families have you worked with, and is it a consulting or a product or both? So we have worked with dozens of families thus far, oh. and the um, composition really is a combination of hands-on consulting services. Mm. But then in our resource platform, the idea is that we have built um, – We've built a platform that really offers the guided experience in terms of taking a parent through high-level education, offering best practices, and then offering the actual how-to to implement. Hmm. So we like to think of it as we help you to turn information into action. So when I was in, lived in Los Angeles, there were a lot of parent coaching mm -hmm. consultants. Yes. Absurdly expensive, $500 an hour, $1,000 an hour. I mean, this was LA, so yeah. people were rich and crazy. Uh, and insane and narcissistic, um, all of those great things. Um, how much do you charge and how do you charge people for coaching them on how to use this technology to build, uh, you know, a, a good culture at home? So, we, And I love the idea, by the way. Yeah, thank you. Um, so it's a membership-based model, okay. and currently it's annually um, based, and it's um, $129 a year. Okay, that's absurdly cheap. Ten bucks a month is probably too cheap. Um and what is the most uh, requested oh. issue? How to take an iPad away from kids? Yeah, I mean, more or less, yes. Um, I mean, it really breaks down into two camps. There, For younger families, it's really around screen time. Mm -hmm. And really, how do you manage the on and off of that device? And how do you set mm -hmm. the parental controls so that explicit content is blocked? And, yeah. Um, access to apps and all those good things. And then for parents of older kids moving into the teen years, it's centers for sure around social media oh. and how to manage the likes of Snapchat and Instagram and um, the tools that can actually help parents to manage on a day-to-day -day basis. Many parents have told me they use something called RPAT, like our agreement. Oh, yes. Our pact. Yes. Our pact. Yes. yes. Um, Apple is about to put them out of business. Oh, really? Yes, that is the latest uh, viral story on the internet right now. What is um, RPACT? So, and um, why is it so coveted by parents? So, RPACT was, in my opinion, the hero company that stepped in about four years ago when parents had absolutely nothing to manage screen time for their children. Mm -hmm. There was no on off switch, there was no ability to control um, access to apps. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a lot of parents are sitting in this very confusing spot of, they know that we live in the 21st century, that um, technology is an in integral part of raising children these days. And how do you get kids um, well-versed in all the opportunities that technology presents, but also provide that global off switch? Mm. So our pack did that very effectively. Um, so it's an app that sits on your iPhone or Android phone 
locks it down. Yes. And you can lock, give a certain number of minutes per day per app. So you could say you can use Snapchat for an hour or half an hour. Yes, exactly. But it doesn't record everything or does it? No. I mean, what it does is offers parents control so that you can give your kids an allowance time according Mm. to whatever your parenting philosophy is. And you can choose which apps you give access to and for how long. So so Snapchat, you might say that's a much, you know, smaller um, allowance that I'm going to give you for that. But something that's more educational, like iMovie, you know, you might want to give your kids a little more free range over that. Got it. Yeah. And you think that'll be built into the iOS operating system shortly? Well, it has. Well, that's a rumor. A- Apple um, launched Screen Time. Yeah, back. we all get those messages now yes. about how addicted we are five hours a day across all devices. Right. Ridiculous. Ex- exactly. So they have a version Screen Time set up for families, but in typical Apple fashion, it's a completely labyrinthian maze. Um, and so it's very confusing for parents to know how to set it up. Mm-hmm. And they think they do it, but then they don't do it effectively. And so usually once they've uh, hit that point, they come to us. What's your biggest challenge? So my biggest challenge is we are in alpha testing right now, and I'm trying to figure out um, exactly the question of scale. So how mm-hmm. do we go from being in this friends and family, very cozy spot to actually growing this into a much um, larger enterprise? Sure. So if you think about what would give you leverage here, mm-hmm. if you're doing consulting, if you're texting with people... Well, there's almost no leverage there, right? Because basically they have to talk to a human and humans only have so many hours in a day. And so then you're in a service-based business where your margin is how little you can pay people and how much you can charge for their time. So if you had some parent who's an expert on this, who you hired as your number two, and you said, I'll pay you 40 bucks an hour to do this work, whatever that works out to, 80,000 a year, you're an expert. I'm going to bill you out at $100 an hour and... Hopefully, you'll be working for more than half the amount of time. You know, you hopefully you bill a hundred thousand hours a year, so I can make the twenty thousand dollars spread, whatever right. it is. And then that person will be like, "Well, I want the whole hundred, and you're taking too much. Twenty percent is too much, whatever it is." So then, building software would be the next possibility, uh, or building some sort of content that would be, if you had content uh, that people could subscribe <clears throat> to. Well, let me just clarify: we yeah. do have that. So we are, it is a resource platform where we have put together this roadmap that takes parents through the education piece to best practices and tools for implementation Mm -hmm. with our guides. So the idea is that we put together the entire package for parents to be able to do this on their own. So I would charge much more. $129 seems super cheap. But uh, let me ask this. How many people have paid? Is it hundreds, dozens, thousands? Um, so we just launched okay. um, to friends and family very recently. Mm-hmm. But, I mean, we have had our consulting clients. We t- do charge a lot more for that. So yeah. that typically ends up being four to five hours of our time. We're charging about $500 for that. And we're at, um, you know, a couple dozen right now yeah. in that realm. So, again... Those consulting agreements, those hourly $100 an hour agreements, I look at those as research and development that you're getting paid for. Mm -hmm. So it's fantastic. Yes. Uh, In terms of productizing it, you know, a tip a day or a video or courses, uh, courses can make money. So Masterclass Mm -hmm. um, is a collection of courses for 25 bucks a month or so. Uh, Calm.com. Steezy is an investment we made in a company that uh, does dance. So if people really want to learn to be a great parent, paying 10 bucks a month is a no-brainer. Um, if there was a great parenting app that taught me and I felt like I really respected the person um, and the, the advice was great, yeah, that would seem like a no-brainer to me. But you would need to build an app that had subscriptions in the app store, and then you would have to master onboarding people and buying traffic and try to figure out if you can get that arbitrage going where you spend $100 acquiring somebody and you make 129 and you break even maybe in the first year and the second year make a profit or maybe hopefully you can acquire people for $30 and get them to subscribe for a $99 product, right? And you have a little bit of profit in there even in the first year. Um, and that's complicated. That means you need, a, you need to have a developer, you need to have a data and uh, analyst type uh, paid marketing expert. Mm-hmm. Um, and so these companies typically take six people, I would say. You would need somebody who makes the content, the product, and that would be you and maybe one other person who's really good at writing or video. Uh, and then the next couple of pieces would be developers. You can actually model this really easily on Patreon mm-hmm, uh, or a right. paid newsletter. So that's another option is to just make a Patreon that says, we're a community for parenting and we send out an update every day with a tip. 
and you can sign up at Patreon. And I think there's some email newsletter platforms that now allow you to start an email newsletter for paid uh, for five bucks a month, 10 bucks a month. I forgot the name of it. Jackie, do you know the names of those paid newsletter platforms? Yeah, see if you can do a search for it. There are some of these paid newsletter platforms. I can't remember the names of them, but one used to be called Tiny Letter, but that got bought by MailChimp. But there's two or three new ones right now that are servicing journalists who want to kind of monetize their thing. Substack, Substack will be the one. So there's a right. company called Substack. I don't know them, but I know they have maybe 50 or 100 newsletters on there where people just say, this is my expertise. Let me see if I can get 1,000 people to pay me $5 a month for this. And if I do... I can have a $60,000 a year job just writing a couple of emails a week. Uh, so have you considered that, like a subscription model just for the content on one of these platforms? Um, well, so we have built a resource platform that mm. does- On we, the web. We've built all of the content. We have- it's On a, a blog or a Squarespace um, site or something? It's on a WordPress site. Perfect. Yes. Yeah, so we, I feel like we've gotten to that point now, yeah. and it's really a matter of how do we- The question is around scale. So yeah. we- um, want to launch that to a broader community mm. that um, and in terms of I guess have we put together the right mix of services so at mm. this point I'm looking at hiring a product manager I'd like to be able to do that but they're expensive if you go down that product route it's going to be conservatively five six people at a hundred plus a year, you're going to talk about a seven hundred fifty thousand dollar a year budget. So it's not going to be cheap to do that. You're going to need to have proper funding. If you do an email newsletter, it's going to require you and another freelancer, and cost fifty thousand. And if you get to a thousand or two thousand people paying a month, and you just take your content on the website and you put it behind a password, or you make half the content paid, maybe, or half of it behind a paywall, um, and just use one of these platforms, you could actually maybe get to hundreds to thousands of people paying for it. That's what I would do, unless you have the ability to raise money and you have a maybe you're not a developer or a product manager yourself. No. So you'd have to build all that around you, which means you'd have to compete here in the, in the Silicon Valley for an app developer who has a job at Calm, FitBod, Headspace, Google, you know, Apple, one of these app developers. It's going to be really hard. It's cutthroat. And so, yeah, not easy. Not easy. Well, in terms of um, growing a user base from a paid email service, yeah. like, do you have any um, advice on how you get the word out about that? Like, sure. Is it super easy? You make great content, and at the bottom you say, "This content is free. If you liked it, we have a paid program where there's, uh, you know, you can get more of this type of content for this amount." So that's typically what people do. If you look at a, an email newsletter called Stratechery, mm -hmm. have you heard of that one? Um, Stratechery. Yeah, you can do a search for it, Stratechery. Um, it's this guy, Ben Thompson. He's sort of like a hero in Silicon Valley. He's an analyst. He lives in Taiwan. And he writes while we're all sleeping about the technology industry. He does really deep analysis. And two days a week are free, like Tuesday, Friday, I think. And Monday, Wednesday, Thursday are paid. So you can get 40% of the content for free. And then he tells people, here's what you missed in the other days of the week. If you want my deep analysis of the new Disney platform and versus Netflix, I did that on Tuesday. Click here. And if you want to participate in the community, pay here. So this is uh, – and then uh, Wait But Why is another one of these content communities. Okay. So getting to tens of thousands to low hundreds of thousands of dollars a year, if you're good at making content and you've got something valuable, is not hard. It might be difficult, but not hard. Building an app? Oh, my Lord. I mean, it's going to be very hard. Very, very hard. You need a lot of resources. It'll take a, you know six months to a year to build, a year to try and get it going. That's why I think Calm started as a website. It was just meditation on a website, and they changed it every day. Then they built the app. Then they went to the next phase, right? Mm -hmm. So I think that's something to definitely consider. And study Patreon. I'm sure you'll yeah. find some – and there's a lot of paid podcasts. So I pay, I pay for two podcasts right now. Cafe Insider, which is Preet Bahar's, the attorney general from New York. He has a free podcast on Thursdays called Stay Tuned with Preet. And then on, two, on Mondays with Am Milgram, who is the attorney general from New Jersey – the two of them talk about legal issues. Obviously, there's a lot of Trump, a lot of Mueller report, but also other stuff that's super interesting. And they, um, I pay them, I think, 
a hundred dollars a year or sixty nine dollars a year something for this fifty time a year podcast. So I guess I'm paying a dollar a podcast, and then I pay for the Brett Easton Ellis podcast on Patreon. So what I would do if I was you is I would just pay for like ten of these content sites and then study what they're doing. Stratetri I pay for, Cafe Insider, and Brett Easton Ellis's podcast among others. And these are all independent content producers who give up a mere ten percent of their money to different platforms, five percent you know, to do credit card billing. And that would be the way to go. Because then you can take your consulting business. You meet with me to talk about, I don't know, um, YouTube. And should your kid be posting on YouTube? And your kid wants to be a YouTube star. Okay, now you make content on that. So you, I pay you $300 to go over this with me and then right. you productize it in a newsletter. Right. It's so brilliant. Yeah. So that's what I would do. And what you'll find is, um, putting out free content and free to pay it is just you get picked up in SEO. It becomes viral. You send it to if you send it to twenty friends how to manage Snapchat, or what to do when your daughter says she wants to post pictures of herself in her bikini or her bathing suit on Instagram. Like, right? Yeah, I'm a couple of years away from dealing with this. Like, what yeah. do I do? <laughs> I have no idea. Like, uh, you add her profile to your profile and keep an eye on it. Yeah. And and order and also Bark is a great monitoring service. Bark? Bark. Yeah. Wow. They can they can monitor all your kids' postings. Really? Mhm. What what do you think of parents insisting on reading their DMs and iMessages of their kids? Um, or having access to it. I think it, it depends on the situation, mm -hmm. parents and the kids. I think that, you know, Personally, my view is that kids have rights to privacy when they're out of the house, and so that's eighteen. Eighteen, and if but I want them to um, have the the space to develop their independence, and yeah. so I think that if there's a good reason mm. to take a look at your kids' emails, I, I think for me personally, that's the starting point. Is I have the right to, but I'm not going to unless uh, you give me. Good we had reason. friends of our family in Los Angeles after we left there. And there was a party, and at this birthday party, there were a bunch of girls laughing in, and this was like, we're talking 10-year-old girls, were laughing in like the bathroom, whatever, and they came in and they were all taking pictures of themselves, but like in various states of Kardashian undress. Yeah. And the mom is like, oh my God, like, wh where did you learn this? It's like, Kim Kardashian is yeah. taking pictures of herself in her underwear, right. so we wanted to take Why pictures not? of ourselves in our underwear. I mean, this is what we're dealing with. So yeah. You know, just even as a parent, like the visceral reaction we have from, oh, my God, this is what right. we have to contend with, that's worth paying for. Well, that's what our texting service is really yeah. intended to be so that you can yeah. ask a question and we can get an yeah. answer back to you in real yeah. time. That should be $99 a month. Again. We'll consider that. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, this has been a great uh, episode. Uh, Thank you so much to uh, the founders who participated. Again, if you would like to participate, email Jackie, and we will see you all next time on This Week in Startups. Bye-bye.